you're going nowhere Don't blame me For what you've done Cause I know, I know, I know That you were having fun Welcome to the Clarified Realty Podcast Exposing the real estate secrets Your agent doesn't want you to know Here's your host, Tom Clary Welcome to the Clarified Realty Podcast. I'm Tom Clary. I'm a real estate agent licensed here in the lovely San Fernando Valley, the most suburban suburb of Los Angeles, California. Uh, The holidays are upon us and we are heading straight on to the new year, only about a week or so to go. So I'm hoping all of you are getting your resolutions in order. Uh, Our good friend and sidekick Ron Bruno will not be joining us today. He's out in mortgage land helping some street urchin like Tiny Tim get into his first home. So good on him. Uh, He'll be back soon. So we'll just do our best to soldier on without him. Uh, So uh, we just had the election about a month or so ago. And uh, unless the Electoral College has anything to say about it, we're now looking at about four years at least of a Donald J. Trump presidency. Uh, Everyone is asking me uh, what a Trump presidency is going to mean to real estate. And uh, will things get better? Will they get worse? Well, I'm going to come right out and give you guys the best answer I can. So uh, this is probably something you want to get a pen and a piece of paper for to write this down. Um, You'll definitely want to, you know, have this written down someplace. So I'll I'll go ahead and wait. Go ahead and get your pen and pencil. All right, you guys ready? All right. Okay, you ready? Good, good. The answer is who the hell knows? Seriously, who the heck knows? This guy's about as predictable as a lotto machine, for God's sake. Uh, Is he the guy that says he's going to kill Obamacare or is he the guy that says he's going to look into it and consider it very carefully? Is he the guy that wants to build a wall or is he the guy that just, you know, he's just fine with half a fence? You know, is he is he the guy that's going to register all the Muslims and throw out all the undocumented immigrants? Maybe. Maybe he is. Is he the guy that's going to, quote unquote, drain the swamp and then goes on to hire every last alligator in Washington to be in his cabinet? Sure, it looks like that's what's going uh, happening. But I mean, but your guess is as good as mine. I mean, at the, end, at the end of the day, what he says, what he said is meaningless, because when it comes down to it, this guy, he's a salesman first. He's the salesperson's agent spirit animal. He's going to say whatever the guy or girl that's directly in front of him wants to hear. And it changes from conversation to conversation. Millions and millions of people across the country, rally after packed rally, bought what he was selling. And what was he selling exactly? Donald J. Trump, of course. Uh, making America great again. Uh, You know, making America, making America great again. I mean, what, what the hell does that even mean? Can you be more ambiguous, more nonspecific? I mean, this isn't a Republican or Democrat thing at this point. All that stuff doesn't even matter. That's just what colored jersey your team is wearing. We're in a whole new territory of of, of complete upside down world here. How could you ever confidently say anything about what the hell the future holds? What you bought on the factory floor ain't what you're driving home, trust me. You got duped. And unfortunately, there ain't no cooling off period for electing a president. No money back guarantee. I, I mean... Who knows what his real agenda is? We're not going to be able to see that until he, you know, we watch his actions after the inauguration. Until then, anything is possible. And maybe then, who knows? And by the way, seriously, if, if, if anyone out there, be it a, a WA, a weak agent, or an SA, a, a, a salesperson agent, gives you an answer, you look them straight in the face and you tell them it's BS. If they say anything, if they make one stupid, dumbass prediction... It will out them as the charlatans I've always warned you about. They are talking directly out of their ass, and they should be called out as such. There's only one specific thing that we've seen already as a result of Trump being elected. Well, pretty much. I mean, we're kind of expecting it anyway, but that's that interest rates are going up. They finally made the move above 4%, and that's, that's what we've kind of already been expecting. So other than that, that's the only thing that we've seen happen for sure. Everything else is up for grabs. But, you know, that being said... It, Hey, I mean, I've got some time to kill. Uh, this, this podcast is about an hour long. So if you're a fan of un, unsubstantiated conjecture and wild postulations, here are some of the best guesses uh, that at least I'm seeing. Now, I would take all of these with a grain of salt the size of the Empire State Building. But all right, you ready? Here it goes. All right. 
Um, Assuming the first off is assuming Trump is actually a Republican, <laughs> which is, I guess, sometimes up for debate. Then working together with the Republican Congress, you're probably going to see a decrease in regulation in the lending world. Uh, and I would assume the repeal of or at least the very least uh, changes to Dodd-Frank. Dodd-Frank uh, was a regulation on the banks after the crash to make sure they stayed healthy. Um, because of Dodd-Frank, a lot of smaller community banks have been forced to keep a certain amount of money on hand to make sure that they they don't go under. So basically, it's a stress test. So if, if this gets lifted, they'll have a lot more money on hand to make loans uh, for, for developers to construct more homes. Uh, more inventory means that prices should start to stop their climb. Look, how would I feel if this happened? Uh, look, I'm not a big fan of overregulation, but we all remember what happened in 2008 when the banks were allowed to, you know, basically play fast and loose with all the rules. I, I don't know. I might, I might get a little nervous. But like I said, who knows? Um, the next one is uh, Forbes.com says that if we see the tax cuts Trump promised in his campaign, um, there'll, there'll be at least a temporary stimulus to the economy. That might be nice. More people are going to get out there in the market with a bit more money in their pocket. That could mean more jobs and more tax revenue, you know, for uh, from those newly employed people. That being said, uh, when the GDP, it, when it starts to rise, we might see an uptick in inflation. And with that, higher, higher interest rates. But here's the, here's the kicker. If the GDP doesn't continue to rise, we'll have a larger, meaner budget de deficit issue. Um, because remember, the government is taking less taxes. And that could force interest rates even higher. There, that's, that's no bueno for the real estate market. And, and, when, and by the way, if you combine these two points about less regulation and there being potentially less taxes in the coffer if the GDP doesn't rise like it should... We know what happened back in 2008 when banks were allowed to play fast and loose with the rules. You combine that with a federal government with no money to bail them out if things get ugly, we're talking a recipe for disaster. There is one positive for the removal of regulation. That's the possibility that there, there might be a loosening of regulations on uh, zoning and land use. Um, getting around this stuff has been very expensive for developers, and they pass the pain on down to you in terms of higher housing prices. So maybe we'll see prices on new construction come down a bit, but I wouldn't hold my breath. Also, uh, also uh, Forbes.com said that because of what they said, past sins, quote unquote past sins, uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac may not survive. You might uh, remember from our previous conversation with Ron that these uh, are two government-sponsored entities that provide uh, government guarantees on, on mortgages, basically making them a lot less expensive for buyers to get. Um, even though you know, both of them have paid back all of their bail bailout money, they made some really bad decisions during the bubble. And some Republican politicians, they may want to make an example of them. Um, if that happens, Forbes, Forbes was saying that 30-year that, uh, fixed rate mortgages are going to go the way of the dodo. Uh, think about that. I mean, the, the, the single most stable mortgage product you can obtain would just disappear. The effect on the market would be dramatic, if not catastrophic. And uh, here's a fun one. Uh, we all know by now that our future president believes that climate change science is just a fiction uh, created by the Chinese to get ahead of us. Um, well, in a recent New York Times article, they said uh, because of rising sea levels around the world, it sounds like more and more buyers are looking to avoid buying houses in coastal zones. Basically, the market might be about to fundamentally change. It was always originally thought, I mean, it's, it's always been the conventional wisdom that the prime property was always on the, breach, the beachfront with an ocean view. Well, maybe not so much anymore. I mean, don't get me wrong, that house on Malibu Beach that you, you, know, you saw on TV didn't just you know, get a $5 million discount, but buyers are, are they're being more and more cautious that their beachside homes aren't going to end up in the middle of the Pacific. Uh, to quote the, the Times that said, uh, quote, 
Some analysts say the economic impact of a collapse in the waterfront property market could surpass that of the bursting dot-com and real estate bubbles of 2000 and 2008, end quote. So our our president-elect just selected uh, Scott Pruitt, a climate science denier, to be head of the EPA. So I'll leave it to you to see if this problem is going to get better or worse under his administration. So if I had a crystal ball, these are some of the predictions I might be making. But guess what? I don't believe in effing crystal balls. I don't. I mean, tea leaves or tarot cards. So there you go. Take that information. Leave it. I don't know. We'll, we'll see if any of it actually comes true. But here's what I do want to talk about. There's a great big freaking elephant in the room with tiny little hobbit hands. There's no way to look at Trump and say with any certainty his administration is what it's going to do. Or, or, or maybe he is going to do exactly what he said on all of his stump speeches. I mean, that would be horrifying and next to impossible, especially where a 1,500-mile wall is concerned. But who knows? And don't get me wrong, I am firmly in the camp that Trump won the election. Our system is about the Electoral College, and he won it. That is not debatable. Period. He will be my president. Yes, you heard me right. My president. None of this not my president stuff for me. To paraphrase my parents, when I was growing up, if you want to live under America's roof, you have to follow America's rules. But yes, Donald Trump will be my president for the next at least four years, maybe eight. You know, or even longer if the conspiracy theorists are right. <laughs> but you can't ignore that more than half the people in America who actually got out and voted didn't even vote for him. And when you add that with the uncertainty of the things I've talked about, about who Trump really is, the, the dramatic increase in hate crimes over the past few weeks, the general feeling that what Americans have always been taught, that it's one person and one vote, it's, it's an absolute lie that their votes counted less just because they lived on the coast instead of Wisconsin. There's, I mean, come on. I mean, there's a growing feeling of helplessness amongst a great many people out here in America. Those people that you saw marching and protesting in the street, they're not marching about sour grapes or, or being bad sports. They don't need you to call a wambulance or, or for you to hand out pacifiers. They're truly afraid for their well-being. They really and truly feel that they've lost any semblance of control over their lives. But here's what I'm here to tell everyone. Nothing could be further from the truth. There is nothing ever to be gained by feeling helpless or complaining or having a victim mentality. And I'm seeing this reaction to the election as a perfect example of this. All the wailing and gnashing of teeth... For all the things I've mentioned above, I-, I get it. There are plenty of totally understandable reasons, but honestly, not a single excuse. I really think that we've all, we've all sort of become addicted to helplessness in this country. And it's, it's not about entitlement I'm talking about. That's, that's something completely different. I think that we use helplessness as an excuse to stay stagnant, to keep the status quo. Look, ult- ultimately... You're the person who makes your own way in life. You're in charge of your own destiny. No change in who the president of the United States is should ever change that. If you think that, you're thinking way too macro. You're thinking way too big. Will it have an impact on you? Sure, sure it will. Will it be the thing that stops or starts you from doing what you want to do in your life? Chances are probably not. I don't believe that. Even President Obama said in an interview in in Rolling Stone, uh, he said, quote, there's no benefit that's derived from pulling up into a fetal position, end quote. You should be the master of your own life. As a matter of fact, spending time being preoccupied by lack of control over things, which are completely out of your hands, can actually distract you from doing things that could very easily put you in a much better situation. And I might even argue that most of the time, You're swerving into that feeling of a helplessness in order to delay making actual definitive decisions or taking actual action to make a different outcome for yourself. Because staying in the same place, there's a real safety there. You know where you're at, right? It's the warm water. 
Making some sort of decision or move is dangerous. I mean, what if you make a mistake? But here's the thing. Sure, I mean, you, you might make a mistake. But what if you don't? Heck, th th I mean, there's probably a better chance that you won't. And then you've completely missed out on a potentially better future for yourself. You wouldn't want to do that, would you? There have been a bunch of interesting articles about how helplessness has a really close connection to selfishness. People who consider themselves to be victims in some shape or form usually have very selfish reasons for seeing themselves that way. Either they, they want to gain pity from others, um, they want to hear, oh, 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 isn't that so sad that happened to you, you poor, poor thing. Or, and I think this is a lot more prevalent, there's a more insidious selfishness, and I believe it's far more dangerous. They perpetuate this victimhood, so they have reasons to delay something that could potentially do harm to them. Not for sure, but there might be a chance harm will come to them. And this is really important when it comes to people who say they would love to buy a house, but find every reason not to take a single action to do so. Buyers are constantly coming up with excuses to push it and push it further and further down the calendar. They say, oh, you know, I don't have a big enough down payment or my credit score, you know, it's too low. But if they don't ever really do anything to fix it or don't even, you know, talk to someone like, like you know, myself or Ron to find out the reality of the situation, all I'm really hearing is, but what if I make a mistake? Or what if I screw this up? Back about... 10 or 20 years ago, when I was working in the film industry, I, I became friends with an amazing screenwriter by the name of Terry Rossio. He, uh, he and his writing partner, they, they've written some amazingly successful blockbusters, like uh, the first few Pirates of the Caribbean movies. Uh, they wrote Aladdin for Disney. Uh, they did uh, rewrites on the first Men in Black. I mean, we're talking huge movies. And he said something that very interesting to me one time. He said that Executives in the film industry are not, they're not in the business of making movies. As a matter of fact, and this is hard to wrap your head around, making a movie is the absolute last thing they want to do. As soon as they do that, their jobs are in jeopardy. As soon as they you know, make a decision and greenlight a script into production, their, their, their necks are, are out there on the line. So... The entire town is like watching them. So they, they go as long as possible without, without actually you know, doing anything other than busy work. See, that's their insidious selfishness. When a movie executive says, uh, you know, well, the, movie, you know, the script isn't ready yet, or you know, we don't have an actor that can open the movie, or uh, the director and the producer, they're not, you know, they're not seeing eye to eye on the concept. That's all just ways that they you know, plead helplessness in order to selfishly avoid actually taking the responsibility of putting a movie into production and thus put their jobs on the line. I mean, just look around at the, at the drivel we get served to us in the movie theaters every weekend. And it's, it's really no wonder. I mean, every single you know, movie looks like every other one. I mean, they're, they're virtually interchangeable. You go up to the ticket window and they ask you, you know, which movie do you want to see? And you, your standard answer is, does it even matter? Either it's a superhero movie or a sequel to something we've all seen a hundred times before. Um, because, I mean, but God, if those, if those executives are actually going to make a decision, they need to be able to point their fingers and say, well, you know, they ate that pile of slop before. I had every reason to believe they would do it again. You know, you can't blame me for that. I mean, God, I mean, God forbid they actually have a gun to their head and need to pull the trigger on a movie. I mean, by then, you know, every <laughs> cool, you know, imperfection or interesting curve has, has, you know, been scrubbed so absolutely smooth. It's like a, a perfectly polished turd, all to minimize the potential risk of their careers. You know, when I was doing research for this episode, I went down a, a couple of very interesting rabbit holes, and and one of them was one of the most I mean, one of the most interesting things that I came across when, when I was looking into the subject of helplessness was actually the first step in Alcoholics Anonymous, which is sort of ironic because I think as a country we're sort of you know becoming addicted to helplessness. But I di I digress. Basically, the, 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 you know, the first step of the AA program goes sort of like this, uh, quote unquote, we, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol. 
that our lives had become unmanageable, end quote. Now, when you first hear that, you hear that word powerless, and you think, see, there you go, my situation is powerless. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. But when you dig a little deeper in and you, you take a closer look, it doesn't mean that you are actually helpless or powerless, period. It just means that there's an aspect of the condition that is beyond your control. You may be an alcoholic, right? Your relationship with alcohol is out of your control. You know, if you, if you drink, you're going to drink too much. But, but here's the thing. That is, if you drink, you're in control of your elbow, right? You can stop your elbow from bending and bringing the drink up to your mouth, right? That's where your power does lie. I mean, you can make your car not drive by the liquor store. You can say, you know, thanks but no thanks when all your office mates want to hit up happy hour after work. You absolutely do have power, and that power is in the actions you take to resolve the issue of the powerlessness. The same goes for real estate. Is it a good market? Is it a bad market? Is, is, you know, is, is, is Donald Trump going to come in and wave his magic wand and make it affordable for you to finally buy your house? Who gives a shit? That's out of your control. Your head is too much in the macro. Instead, you really, you know, if you really do want to buy a house, you should be out doing something. Focusing on the details, on the, on the micro. Go to an open house in a neighborhood that works for you. Look at the price tag. Talk to your lender. Can you do it? Good. Let's put in an offer. If not, move on to the next. But if you're navel-gazing about what policy some stuffed shirt in Washington or Trump Tower, which I guess is where the new White House is going to be, is going, you know, he's going to make, you're already heading the wrong way. So I want to take a little pause here and tell you a little bit about my Thanksgiving. Um, so I was uh, sort of preparing myself for about a week for what I thought, what I thought was going to be a horrible night of, of, of very awkward and ham-handed political statements, you know, flying back and forth over the cranberries and stuffing like, you know, verbal intercontinental ballistic missiles. I mean, I mean, seriously, I was expecting something akin to my version of the Alamo, right? Which, if I do the math correctly, would make me Daniel Boone. Um, but it was, it was the ultimate Mexican standoff, right? But I have to say, luckily, either everyone was just, you know, surprisingly, you know, just they surprisingly behaved themselves, or they were just too happy drunk to kill the buzz. Uh, trust me, my guess is in the latter and not the former, but... You know, while we <laughs> while we were waiting for the, you know, for everything to, to make its way to the table, I, I started up a conversation with with uh, with my nephew. He's you know become this amazing guy that, you know, he falls squarely in that you know in that some you know what what some people would call derisively, uh, you know, would label them the millennial category, right? So we started chatting, and I happened to mention that you know this podcast, and I was explaining to him you know, about what I'm trying to do, how I'm, you know, trying to systematically remove the fear from what is really not that complicated of a process. And he seemed really responsive to it. He, I mean, he got really animated and he said, you know, something along the lines, along the lines of, um, absolutely, you know, that's exactly what my, you know, folks my age need. I'd love to buy a house, but where do I start? So I went on to tell him about, you know, the quote unquote, you know, pipeline, uh, I've discussed, you know, back in episode two with Ron, I said that, you know, you start by educating yourself and then you find a financial advisor that helps to, you know, shape your budget and what you can afford. And then you talk to a lender like, you know, Ron to see what you qualify for and get approved for a loan. Then, then you come to a guy like me, like I've said on this podcast, you educate yourself as much as you can and then you pick the right team. Why should there be any fear? This process ain't rocket surgery. And then he said something very telling. He said, well, yeah, but how do I know how to pick the right people for the team? I mean, what if I pick the wrong ones? And then wham, it became perfectly clear. This fear of making a mistake, this attitude of helplessness is absolutely paralyzing people. 
If you're coming up with reasons like this for not moving forward, part of the problem is you. And you need to start accepting this. But listen, don't, don't think I'm getting all judgmental on them. It actually makes total sense. I, I know a lot of times this sort of behavior is considered by folks outside of the millennial generation. You know, they perceive it as, you know, entitlement. Like, these hipsters just want it to be given to them on a silver platter or spoon-fed to them. Absolutely not. They are understandably afraid. They have very real reasons for being afraid. After the crash, folks got shell-shocked. They probably know at least one or two families personally who got kicked out of their homes and foreclosed upon. That kind of stuff leaves a mark. I mean, believe me when I say they got a bad case of PTSD for the real estate market. They are so afraid of making a mistake, they feel helpless. Add to that being told in the media how awful their prospects are, they're afraid of their own shadow. Because, you know, because of this, a lot of them go into the whole victim mentality. You know, I'd love to buy a house, but I can't afford it. Or, oh, I'd love to buy a house, but don't, you know, I don't have 20% down. And so on and so on and so on. Listen, if you're not emotionally ready to buy a house, then absolutely save that. Own it. If you're self-reflective enough to know that buying a house isn't the thing for you or what you want to do right now, I would would never even think about pressuring someone into buying a house if they didn't want to. Actually, if you want to know the truth, that's a really good way to tell the difference between a weak slash salesperson agent and a protector agent. The protector agent is concerned about you as a whole and not only concerned about making the sale at any cost. If you tell an agent that you're not ready to buy a house and they keep pushing... You should literally picture a scarlet letter on their chest. Seriously, they are not thinking about your best interests at all. Run for the freaking hills. There's more than enough business to, you know, for people who actually want to buy a house. We don't have to hold proverbial guns to their heads and make them feel coerced into it. But here's the thing. On the other side of that coin, if you do tell me that you would you know, love to buy a house but then follow that up with this mealy mouth litany of reasons why you haven't started the process and you haven't taken a single tangible step to actually get said house, meaning you haven't talked to a lender or a financial advisor, you know, finding out what your actual credit score is, blah, 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 then I'm going to have to respectfully call bullshit on you. Look, all I'm saying is if you want to buy a house, if you really, really believe in your heart that you want to buy a house, put your feet on a path and start walking, period. Don't tell me you don't have enough for a down payment. Don't tell me you can't afford anything unless you have actually taken steps to find out actual information about it. To confirm or deny this. If if, if not, then you're just pretending. Listen, I'll, I'll be the first to say that some people might have longer paths than others. Some have it shorter. But the key is to actually move forward. Move in small, tiny increments. That's fine. Nobody's watching. You don't have to prove anything to anybody. Nobody's going to judge you. But even if it's 10 years down the line, you're just delaying it if you don't actually put one foot in front of the other. So let's dig a little deeper into what my nephew said. How do I know how to pick the right people for my team? Right? Because there are definite common sense steps that you can take to find people that will, you know, that'll do a great job for you, be they a financial advisor or a lender or even a real estate agent like myself. I'm not going to discuss specific items you should be looking for with each of these, but, you know, that's for a later podcast. But, but in general, if you are looking for people to do business with, how do you find someone you can trust? How can you build a good team? Okay, well. Seems like a simple enough concept, so let's just, you know, break it down, you know, uh, by the first things that, you know, come to me. Um, If I was starting off, I think that my first step uh, would be to find my my one. Um, Now, what what do I mean by that? My my one is the first solid uh, keystone member of the process. It's the it's like the, the key person that I I grow my team from. You know, it doesn't have to be, you know, specifically be a, le- a realtor or, or, or a lender, just someone along the path of the process. When, you know, when you talk to them, you should, you should have 
um, an excellent rapport with them because, you know, Lord knows how many late night phone calls you're going to need to make. And you want to make sure that they will not only be there for you, but, you know, provide comfort when they can. They should, they should strike you as a protector, someone who wants to make sure, you know, both of you cross the finish line safely. They should also be somebody that has a very good map of the terrain. They know the process backwards and forwards, and they should have good resources to find the, the other members of the team. Now, sometimes they, they may have other members or, you know, that they already work with, and that, that could be good or that could be bad. You know, um, you should never blindly take on a lender or a financial advisor or uh, an accountant they, you know, they work with without interviewing those individuals as well. If, if you don't, you know, and also if you don't use one of the people that they work with a lot, they shouldn't take it personally and, and help you find someone else. If they don't, you know, if they don't have people that they usually refer to, then utilize them as a co-interviewer. Let's say you're working with a really cool lender like Ron. Uh, but maybe for whatever reason, you don't get along with the accountant he refers you to. When you find another person that you might consider for the job, have Ron get on the phone with them. Ron knows the goal you're both trying to achieve, and there's a really good chance that he's going to be able to tell if that person understands the common goal and can help get you there. Now, how do I find my one? Well, there's a pretty good chance that you already you already know someone who's recently bought a house or you know worked with a financial advisor and had you know a good experience. This is this should be a pretty you know this should be pretty simple to find. It's not like you're you know, asking for referrals for something no one has ever heard of before, like you know somebody builds nuclear reactors for submarines or you know synthesizes some complex chemical. I mean it's it's a lot of people buy houses. A lot of people go to financial advisors. If it's not your, you know, your friend, then ask your mom or dad or a cousin. I mean, there's there's a pretty good chance you know someone that's had a positive experience buying a home. I mean, you should, of course, interview them yourself. But if they've had a good experience, it's at least a clue that the person might do as good a job for you. I mean, I, I personally, I prefer this to going to, you know, Yelp or Zillow or other refu- review sites because the person you're asking, your, your, your cousin, your mom, your dad, has an extra piece of the puzzle. They, they know you, and they can usually tell you whether or not someone is going to be a good fit for you. So things like, you know, restaurants and bars, sure, if someplace has four or five stars, I might, you know, give them, if Yelp says, you know, give them a try, I'll give them a try. But for something as important and personal as buying a house, I, I say avoid the online reviews if you can. If you don't have any other choice, then yeah, go ahead. But I would make sure to exhaust uh, any, you know, personal vouches and referrals first. So, uh, so your dad or your friends say, oh yeah, I've got an amazing guy or, or girl and, and, and you'd love them. And then they, you know, they scribble down their info on a piece of paper and hand it to you. Here's the thing. When they give you the phone number or they give you the email address, don't just put it in your back pocket and get it destroyed when you throw it in the washer. Actually contact the person at least within the first 24 hours. I mean, that's an actual thing you can do. If you don't, then there's a really good chance that you are just putting things off in order to avoid the potential, not the reality, the potential of making a mistake. Because trust me, they will be happy to talk to you. You don't have to commit to anything, and you'll have a genuine you know, piece of information instead of just conjecture. And then there's one last option here, and it, it actually takes me back to my friend, Terry Rossio, the screenwriter. Uh, he used to walk into writing seminars that, you know, that he would give. He'd walk over the chalkboard or, or, or you know, dry erase board and write his own personal private email on it. He would you know, say, quote, you know, quote, unquote, when you have a script that you think is absolutely ready to go, when you have a script that is ready to be made, I want you to email it to me here. Well, same goes for you guys. At the end of each and every podcast, I give you guys my email and all sorts of various ways to contact me. I'll be more than happy to talk to you about the process 
and help you build the team that will help you buy a house. But like Terry, the, <laughs> the reason we both have no problem putting this information out there is because we know you probably won't take advantage of it. We know we're not going to get 5,000 emails a day flooding in. Because the chances that most of you guys out there are actually going to take action is incredibly, incredibly slim. Most of you will listen to this podcast and not make a single move. You'll still go to parties and have conversations where you're convincing yourself over and over, oh, I'd love to buy a house. It's just not in the cards for me right now. But I'll still be here. If you genuinely want my help and you can show me that you're actually taking actions to make your goal come true, I'll be happy to help you find and vet other people for your team. By the way, anyone who does help you pick out a team can't ever guarantee that someone in that team isn't going to let you down. There are no guarantees in life. The trick is making sure that if something does happen, you get back up, dust yourself off, and, and keep heading down the road. If you do your due diligence in researching and picking your team out, you'll probably avoid a lot of these situations. But life isn't some sheltered bubble, but it isn't one where one mistake kills you either. If something comes up that's a problem, you, you hopefully have surrounded yourself with a great group of people that can you know, help mitigate the damage and hopefully help prevent them from you know, doing any harm at all. And, and you should be asking yourself the whole time, is this person, are these people protecting me? If your answer is no, then you have the power to change who is on the team and get someone new. You're not helpless. At any stage during the process, you can change someone on the team. Are they protecting me? Do they have ulterior motives? Do I have faith in them? If the answer is no, move to someone who will. What this rant is really about is you're never helpless. You have more power than you could ever know. You just need to take action. When it comes down to it, in almost every circumstance that's handed to you, you're, you're either taking an action or you're being a victim of your own making. I know what end of the spectrum I want to be on. The question is, do you? So Trump or no Trump... You make your future. So that's it for today. Um, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to leave them for us on our Facebook page, facebook.com slash clarified realty podcast, all one word. Uh, like I said before, you can email me directly at tom at clarified realty.com. For more exclusive bonus content and advice between episodes, please check out our website, www.clarifiedrealty.com. Also on our homepage, you'll find links to helpful buyer and seller guides that can give you some great information for starting your home buying or home seller process. So check those out. I'm on Snapchat, Twitter, and Instagram as well. My handle for all three of those are at Clarified Realty. I beg of you, please, 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 every single time, I beg of you, please leave feedback in reviews on iTunes or in the comments section on our page. Uh, my amazing theme song, Hey Now, is from the band Wolf. That's Wolf with two Fs. And please go check them out and like them on SoundCloud. We'll also leave a link to the song in the credits if we can. They rock so hard, they don't need no stinking ring count to prove it. And just a little disclaimer, I am licensed by the California Bureau of Real Estate. My license number is 01715353. The advice we give is only for properties located in the state of California. For all other states, please contact your local real estate agent or real estate professional. And that's about it. All right, everybody. Thanks for coming by. And remember, the greatest thing you can ever do is make someone feel at home. Take care. Uh, we will not be here next uh, week. We're, that's going to be our Christmas break. Uh, we'll be back after the first of the year, but uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Take care. Now.